Well, what do you think? Just move. Are we? And I would like to start. Oh, do you want me to? Can I introduce you guys? Yeah. Do the same thing. Ready to go whenever you are. You can. Hi, guys. Okay, I was just kind of waiting to see who else was going to trickle in. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Allie Jacoby. I'm one of the speech language pathologists in acute care here. Um, I work with adults. Um, I invited Anat and Neil here today um, I got, because I wanted to share the work with our health region and other medical professionals. Um, I first found out about the work through our pediatrician and we started taking my son who is 18 months old at the time to see a local practitioner named Dan who's here today. And um, after a few lessons, it actually completely changed the trajectory of his development. And um, we were sold on it and we started going to the center in California. And just, just mention briefly about your son and his diagnosis. And... Okay, Nash has, uh, he's four now, he has cerebral palsy and a hypoxic brain injury in utero. So, um, yeah, is that enough? <laughs> okay. So anyway, he, um, you know, we didn't know what he would be able to do and um, we know kind of we're told worst case scenario and maybe if anything better comes of that, then that's great. So, um, yeah, he's been doing amazing and he, you know, he started walking at almost when he, just before he turned three and he's talking and he's doing great. But I know you guys aren't here to talk about the kids. Um, the reason especially I wanted them to come talk today to you guys is because in our trips to the center in California, I met a girl named Tessa who had a stroke as an adult, spent three days in her apartment um, before she was found. And I mean, 60% of her brain was wiped out. And she left rehab after two months and she still only had three words. And I met her over time and each time I saw her, she was talking more and then talking fluently. And I had to know what are they doing differently because I'm a speech pathologist and if she only has three words, after two months in rehab, what are they doing? I need to know what they're doing. So anyway, of course, there were lots of physical changes too, but that wasn't what I was interested in for myself, of course. I mean, of course, do you know what I mean? As a professional anyways. Um, so, okay, I'll stop it there. Um, I, I just felt, I, I feel very obligated to share this with you because we're all here to learn we're all here, we take continuing education, we're always learning new things. And uh, this, is, this is a great, not new to them, but new to us. So I will introduce Neil. He, is, uh, he works with my son Nash. He is one of my teachers in my training. I'm taking the training right now. And um, it works closely with Anat. So I will let him introduce himself in Anat. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ellie. <clears throat> it's a great, great honor and pleasure for us to be here. Thank you for welcoming, me, welcoming us. Uh, my name is Neil Sharp. I'm from the UK, as you can probably hear. <clears throat> and I trained uh, as an MD in Cambridge and Edinburgh in the 80s. And uh, medicine for me was a, a huge passion. And I was very committed to, to finding you know, the best I could do for my patients. And I met some fabulous doctors along the way. But one thing that we were not taught much about was brain plasticity. Uh, it was really not known about in the 80s. I discovered a Nats work 15 years ago. And uh, when I felt it in my body, I realized it had something to do with my brain and my nervous system that my medical training hadn't prepared me for. I came to study with her and ultimately now work and collaborate with her. And as part of that collaboration, I've been looking into the developments in neuroscience and neuroplasticity that have been occurring over the last 30 years that we all now are so familiar about hearing with and finding that people like Anat and especially Anat have found ways of using these principles through their experience of working with people. So part of my remit for coming over here to the States to work with her and to train with her was to really help provide a bridge for her to bring these incredible ideas into a very fertile environment, which is the current medical neuroscience community who are all like, okay, how can we capitalize on what we now know as this incredible resource? 
So I don't want to say any more because Anad is going to speak in great detail about why she believes what she has discovered works. And uh, we will show you a, a few clips of videos of people we've been working with. So, Anad. Thank you very much, Neil. I think it's going to work. Is it working? Is it loud enough? Yes, you can hear me? I always find myself asking this question, and it's absolutely ridiculous, because the people who can't hear me <laughs> won't be able to say no. <laughs> it's, but I still do it. At the end, everybody here as well? OK. So good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. It's very wonderful and thrilling for me for us to be here. We have, you know, some of our graduates, and I see some of my graduates that flew in from the east coast of Canada. Hi, Judy. Hi there. All right. So I see you too, students from the training. Anyway, uh, when Neil said at the end, "Why I believe what I believe," I don't really believe. I sort of am a, that what we do works. We see that what we do works. I mean. What gives me the courage and the impetus to, you know, to fly out here to talk to people like you is because I would like other people to have access to what we have access. And when I start doing the work and start getting the outcomes that we start getting, the clients are getting, you know, I had people who said, oh, I have magic hands, Anat has magic hands, or one client bought me a beautiful book of... Uh, O'Keefe with the hand, her hands on the sense she said that I have Jesus hands and and you know so maybe you know who knows but <laughs> the the thing is that now we have trained hundreds of people and we get you know Facebook and emails and and they are, and we hear from them and many of my practitioners clients we never I never meet and they get outcomes that means there is something reliable and predictable and teachable or learnable that it can be transmitted to other people. And that's where, the, for me, where the thrill and the excitement is. So let's begin. Um, is there a way to just turn this a little bit towards me? OK. Yeah. He, he knows not to let me touch it. <laughs> OK. All right. So the, um, the title of the presentation is Neuroplasticity in Stroke Rehabilitation. Neuroplasticity in Stroke Rehabilitation, Breakthrough Outcomes and Recovery Through a Anad Vanille Method Neuromovement. And taking advantage of the enormous potential of brain plasticity for, you know, for stroke recovery and in general. So this is really what, for, for me, the focus of this uh, presentation is. So, you know, I'm assuming, I'm quite sure that all of you have heard about brain change, brain plasticity, and one of the best books ever written about the topic was by Canadian Norman Deutsch, you know, The Brain That Changes Itself, followed by his second book, uh, The Brain's Way of Healing. And um, so, so it's, and he really, the, the book, The Brain Changes Itself, is a magnificent book, and he really helped put the topic you know, popularize it, but in a very responsible and, and high-end way. He didn't popularize it and diminish the, the quality of the conversation. And he's a wonderful storyteller, so that, that's wonderful. So we just looked, and we actually had the percentages. Canada has a lower percentage than the United States relative to the population, but we forgot to put it in, so I don't remember what it is. But... Canada has around 50,000 strokes per year, third leading cause of death. More women die of stroke than, than breast cancer. Um, a stroke every 10 minutes. About 426,000 Canadians are living with the effects of stroke, the leading preventable cause of disability. Now, I don't know if those statistics include children or not. My suspicion is it probably does not. My sense by the way they word it is that it's really adults. But I, I actually don't know. In the United States, nearly 800,000 strokes per year. Number five cause of death every 40 seconds. A death from stroke every four minutes, a leading cause of long-term disability. And that's really where 
we fall, this presentation falls about maybe having less of the disability part. The leading preventable cause of disability, 87% of strokes are classified as ischemic strokes. Neural movement often yields outstanding outcomes in patients with stroke. We will show outcomes from our work. We will explain the process that leads to these outcomes. We will lead you through a short movement experience. So you actually experience something little that we'll do that will get you to feel immediate changes in yourself because the, when we communicate with the brain in, an, in a way that's effective, that the brain in its own language, so to speak, the changes are practically instantaneous. And uh, we will introduce the principles of our work and ways to incorporate them into rehabilitation and its impact on prognosis. So what you'll hear here today, if you're up to and open to experimenting with it, those of you who do the therapy part, how many of you are actually uh, practitioners like uh, physical therapists, occupational, speech, that work with patients, any kind of patients, raise your hand. Fantastic. And how many of you here are doctors that see the patients or diagnose patients? There's one MD here. Well, oh, sorry. Yeah, you see, you got my brain to see once you moved your arms. Yep, that's good. Thank you for being here because you're the gateway to everything else. So it's really, really important. And how many of you are here, here are for uh, yourself or family member or any other reason, but not part of the medical? Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Um, so how to incorporate and uh, in re interability and its impact on prognosis. Uh, these principles and approaches are applicable much wider than just stroke. So just know it's not just for stroke. Uh, uh, because pretty much every human carries a brain in their head. So if we can impact the brain in positive ways, then, you know, it's a, it has a very, could be very favorable outcomes. We will discuss the implications for rehabilitation and Q&A. Uh, okay. What is neuromovement? <clears throat> Neuro, and if you're interested, we can uh, provide a PDF of this uh, you know, presentation because I'm going to go through, this is dense. We've prepared that for the functional medicine conference that we're doing with a colleague from Harvard and you work with a colleague from Harvard that dense things up. <laughs> Neural movement is a systematic approach to communicating with the brain through its primordial language, movement that awakens the remarkable capacity of the brain to create new connections and new possibilities. Upgrading the quality of functioning of the brain itself transforms the field of possibilities going beyond what would otherwise be available. This is, this is an invisible for a lot of people. The brain itself can operate at different levels of quality, doing its job at different levels of quality, just like the heart, just like the eyes, just like the skin, just like the digestive systems, system. So we can upgrade or degrade the quality with which the, any of our systems works. And the brain is subject to upgrading or degrading its quality actually very, very readily in both directions. So we will talk about how to move it in an upgraded direction of operation rather than a degraded direction of operation. The brain's initial formation of capabilities and its initial grasp of cause and effect come through processing the sensations and experiences resulting from movement. The reason this is also relevant is because when someone has a stroke, there is a need and a requirement to create from scratch or recreate lost function. So we're looking, how does the brain do it? to begin with, because it probably will do it in very similar ways, if not identical, a second time, or a third time, or a new function altogether, right? So working, I work with musicians, or dancers, or whatever. Anyway, neural movement is implemented in brain-friendly ways. Terribly important to, to, to remember that for rehabilitation. Meaning harmonious with the conditions that drive positive brain change and it is applicable throughout the life course or lifespan. Underlying principles of neuromovement. 
The brain works as a whole a in a dynamic, nonlinear, complex systems fashion. Again, when we look, oops, we're getting the chirping thing again. We had it yesterday. When people they come online, you know, on the remote thing. Anyway, we'll talk about it some more, you'll see, but when someone loses an ability, in this case is a result of a stroke, and we want, we would like, and they would like to regain that capability back. It's really important to understand, we need to let the guy know that this is happening again. Ali? Okay. Can you mute on the video side everybody that's listening on the web? Because otherwise we get all kinds of noise in here. It doesn't work. People don't listen. Have you noticed? You know, I started teaching this work. Ah, really? No, not yet. Talk to the guy, in, in, he's next door. Yeah, okay. And to stay on top of it if possible, okay, so we don't have to call for it. Next time, if we do something like this, we'll have a big slide that we could pop back. Mute your computer, or I won't continue. Anyway. So, the, and we'll, we'll go into detail into this, but how we influence in a predictable direction a complex, nonlinear, dynamic, very large dynamic system is a very, very important question, and it's different than what we normally use, the mechanisms we use to impact our world. So we'll get to that. So the brain works as a whole in a dynamic, nonlinear, complex systems fashion. The brain performs many types of computations, some of which may be localized. However, in practice, the brain always works and provides outcome as an integrated whole. The brain computes for adjustments around the whole body, the whole person, in relation to every specific movement, action, and intention. That means that when we work with someone that we're trying to help accomplish something, again, in this case, stroke patient, there is a need to gauge to, to as many dimensions, at least that come to the forefront, as, as show themselves, or we get unintended consequences or simply unknown consequences, but that they impact the process very profoundly. We just don't know what's going on. The brain has no known limit to its potential for continued differentiation. That means to continued learning and improvement through increasingly more complex computations, which allow the brain progressively to achieve new skills and optimize their quality and refinement. Further features of neural movement, medical diagnosis and intervention is of utmost importance. I train my people, you know, I get a certain percentage of the people that come to study with me, they are holistic, new age, uh, whatever labels it has, and they feel that they're like in war with medicine. So I make it very clear that for me, the medical world is one of my best allies, and I'm really, really grateful to it because I'm alive today because of it. My daughter is alive with it because <laughs> today because of it. And what med medicine can do is quite remarkable. And I collaborate with doctors and I send my clients to find out things because the medical part is extremely important. And so that's just like bottom line. The diagnosis, though, does not restrict us in terms of the prognosis. That's where this starts being a difference. So when somebody presents like Tessa that uh, Ali mentioned, she showed up and it was very, very serious. And it was hard. It was a hard situation, a beautiful young woman that had this massive stroke, wasn't uh, discovered for quite a while, and then had the rehab and had, did better than she would have done without the rehab, but she had a big 
ceiling on top of how far she went. Anyway, the re so the, the, the diagnosis for us does not necessarily imply the prognosis that currently usually is attached to the, the specific diagnosis. The rate of response and improvement to the intervention is the better predictor of the extent of recovery. So what I found out if, uh, over the years is that when I work with someone, the degree to which the person begins responding, and, and so if we take Nash, Ali's son, he, I think, had a, not a great prognosis, right? And and for a good reason, because if he stayed on the trajectory that he was on, how old was he when we got him first two? 18. 18, a year and a half old. So if he stayed on the, on the trajectory, so if you think of it like, you know, there's this in intense high-speed trajectory for children in the first three, three years, it slows down a little bit, but it's still, it's remarkable, right? Ooh, their learning curve. But if, they, if it gets here and certain things don't happen and they need to happen in order for the other things to start happening, you can sort of see the trajectory where it's going. That's the prognosis. That's the trajectory. And that trajectory, is, that prognosis is accurate given if that trajectory will continue. What happened with Nash is that when we started working, things started changing that certain things quickly, other things took longer, that shifted the trajectory. I haven't seen Nash now for a few months. I gave him a session yesterday, and he's like a different, he's Nash, but he's a different human being. He's standing upright, he's walking, he's cognitively really working much higher level, so he's also maturing, but it's more than that. And, and I had a four-year-old child lying on the table completely quiet, <laughs> and if you had known Nash, that was not an option, uh, <laughs> for about 25 minutes with pretty significant changes, right? Because there's still a lot to do because the damage that happened to that brain is real. So you have the two things together. So the rate of response and improvement to the intervention is, better, uh, is the better predictor of the possible extent of uh, the, po the potential for improvement. Tessa, so we're going to see a video in a second, from her stroke through discharge, discharge from rehab. Date of stroke was December 1st, uh, 14. She was 28 at the time. Former Indianapolis Colts cheerleader, model, and professional dancer. Left-sided ischemic stroke, no speech immediately after stroke. I mean, for all practical purposes, she had uh, very few words she could retrieve and had incredible uh, uh, difficulty actually uh, 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 what's the word? Uh, articulating the, the words. Really difficult. So it was both, uh, and then the thinking was also she would confuse befores and after. She had no capacity for time sequencing. That came, oh, it took a while before she could make an airplane reservation, even when she could talk, that was not something she could freely do. So the thinking was garbled, and she was, of course, traumatized by what happened to her, not just the medical trauma, the emotional trauma, the loss. She was depressed. I mean, there's a lot. Left-sided in skin stroke, no speech, in bed 36 hours before fell out of bed and was found. Ten days in ICU, six weeks in rehab, minimal progress after discharge from rehab but before ABM an body method neural movement. That's we just short it. So um, in the, the the video, it's her boyfriend that cut it, and he's in LA, so it's a little glitzy, <laughs> but it's well done. So there we go. Oh no, Tess on arrival at ABM. Sorry, there's more. No sensation on the whole right side except pain. So she could feel pain. She could not feel anything else on the right side. Constant loud ringing in the, in the right ear. Right arm and hand very spastic and non-functional. Brace on right leg. Precarious balance. Walking with a, with a, ca a cane. Yeah, it was a cane. Marked aphasia. Stuck on work. Major word finding difficulties. Stuttered. 
difficulty articulating, major difficulty forming complete sentences. Mental confusion, difficulty forming clear thoughts, reduced capabilities. Could not read at all, though could recognize letters. Used writing letters on board to, trigger, to try and trigger memory of words with limited success. Used, uh, sorry, could barely communicate without communication board, could not shower, bathe, or dress independently, depression and despair. Here she is. Pretty. Hi, my name's Tessa David, and this is my story. On December 1st, 2014, I had a massive stroke. I was showering for work, and I started going dizzy, and my arm went numb. I got it out of the shower, and my leg started to go numb on me, and I had intense pain in my head, it like knives sticking in it. I was so scared, I didn't want, know what to do. I crawled to my room, to my bed, and I passed out. For almost two days, I was trapped in my bed. I felt vulnerable, and I didn't know what was going on. Scared, I was really scared. Never then thought in my life that I was having a stroke. I woke up in the hospital. I couldn't walk, talk, move my right arm or my right leg. I was very limited in my movement. Once I was discharged from ICU, I started therapy. PT and OT helped me so much and got me an AFO. They were afraid of my knee injury and my foot turning in. Two hours per day, every day. There you go. Yes, this is what I want right here. They pushed me and I would be exhausted. Oh, there it is. My arm would contract after that and like would be so tense after that. And I had a horrible ringing in my ear. I met Jill Boldy Taylor at the hospital and she said, stop what you're doing and go see an out video. I thought that a not video was a country or something. I didn't know what it was. It hurt. Transition from here to here. So My down. dad took me and 120 people were in it and I was scared. You're getting a spasm? It's okay, hon. It's okay. Take a break. Take a break. Anat had a connection to my body. Is this better? She knew what was going on with my brain. We've done a lot in one time. She knew everything was connected in my body. And she got done. And I went to dinner with my dad. And it stopped ringing in my ear. I was so excited. I knew I had to continue with her. That's it. Can you feel that the hand arrived here? Yes. Can you feel the, the contact here? Yes. You feel that? Pushing your belly out? That's it. Mm -hmm. That's picking out? Uh, Excellent. Here we go. <gasps> Sylvia, help me get my heel to the ground. It's the first time I've done it it's since my stroke. Fantastic. <laughs> I just got done three weeks of in, uh, in 
intensive training at Anat Benil Studios, uh, speaking um, and walking. I got my heel down and my arms moving. I felt my hand burning. <laughs> it's getting better. I'm doing the tibia toes. I'm, um, I'm walking better up and down stairs. Anat helped me improve with my mobility and my speech. I can't the move a movement drive. Hi, I'm at Anat Benielle's training today and I'm so scared and I'm excited and I can't wait for the training to start. I don't know where I'd be if it wasn't for Anat's training. I'm truly grateful. I want to give back so much. I want to get better every day and help others in life. Okay. Hey, I'm Kai. Oh. Anyway. Hey, is there a tissue for a crying presenter? <laughs> oh, I have one in my bag. Probably. Yeah. I don't get emotional when I do the work because I'm focused differently. But when I watch this, I cry in movies. Yeah. Anyway. So, the job of the brain is to put order in the, in the disorder, not into, but in the disorder, and make sense out of the nonsense. So, again, the job of the brain is to put order in the disorder and make sense out of the nonsense. That's very, very important. It sounds so simplistic, but it's very, very fundamental and important. The brain. So it's important to talk about the mechanical system versus the information system. I, the mechanical system... We don't have the video. doesn't matter. The mechanical system, meaning, first of all, our body. So when we think about our body and how it works and how we learn to manage it, it's a mechanical system. It has weights, levers, pulleys. What? Uh, sure. I'll talk in the meanwhile. Uh, pulleys and all that stuff. And a child, when they're born, they have no voluntary movement at all. So the movement that they have, that the baby has, that will eventually be like what I do with my arms now, starts by, by random movements, by unintentional little twitches. The brain has some connectivity to the, with the body that was formed in utero, and there is the reflexes, so there's this involuntary, what I call random movements. Those movements are incredibly important. Without the random movements, the initial, random, unintentional, and outside of the voluntary system movements, without those, the child will not learn to move. If you read my book, or if you've read my book, Kids Beyond Limits, I describe a case of a child that was put <clears throat> after birth in a whole body cast to try to protect the hip joints that were, you know, malformed for nine months. That child was a perfectly healthy baby. He looked like a Gerber baby, you know, the face. And the only thing that he really could move that was free to move was the arms. So the arms had this really, what I'd call crazy movement, like flipping movements. But when they took the cast off, he couldn't move. Perfectly healthy child. And I, I figured that with lack of movement, the brain got lack of information. With lack of information, it couldn't organize movement. When you take the cast off, what the hell are you going to do? I mean, the brain, it doesn't work in a vacuum. It works in a very dense, uh, progressive process of differentiation and integration. So 
I just did whatever I did with this child. He started crawling, by the way, within 20 minutes of the lesson. I have it on video, just not here. So that was for me, like, I didn't need to go and do, like, a double-blind research to <laughs> figure out that this is really how it works. And, of course, over the years, children have limitation movement due to different reasons, and then they cannot, they don't learn to move because there isn't the initial random movement. So... Uh, I am going to do the little boy. So just to see the, this is, <coughs> look at this child. He's alive. I mean, he gets to do something and he gets out of it. He gets to do it again. And it's predictable. I push him, he falls. I do this little boy. My arm is out. Okay. Let's, let's now. So, so the, the, the thing is, it, but it's very important to really internalize this distinction. Because in the mechanical model, which is extremely important, it's not like, oh, mechanical is bad. There are certain rules how it works. So if I go to, to your bottle of water and I just put and do this, I move it a little bit, I feel the pressure, but it comes back. But if I do and then I put more force, it'll fall over, right? Now, we can do, you know, physics, um, you know, Newtonian physics and explain it. But the baby doesn't need to know Newtonian physics. Then anyway, do it fast. It'll happen harder and faster. So faster gives different outcome. Harder gives different outcome. More force is, is very effective in many ways. Certain things that don't happen when I do it slow, I kind of yank it faster and it happens. We learn those rules of engagement. Oh, yeah, sorry. So, so that, that, is, that is the mechanical model. Then there is the information model, the information system. And that's where I think so much of rehab, education, oops, oh, it's coming back, in, in general in schools, a lot of ways in which we try to promote learning, promote gaining of what has not, is not there yet, actually is done in a very diminished way compared to the potential and possibility that inhabits us. So it's not a criticism of anything. It's just now that we know so much more about the brain, it's an opportunity to take advantage of it intentionally. You know, a huge jump in human consciousness and possibilities was creating physical therapy and rehab. How, how, how long ago? 80 years ago? 100 when it became a formal thing? You guys should know better than me. But it's new. It's very new. But to take a child or an adult that is, has these kind of limitations and look at them and say, hey, if I invest in them a certain process, they could do better. They can have a better quality of life. They can live longer. That is new. Psychotherapy is really new. You had some things happen to you. You learned certain things uh, growing up. And now you don't have to be a slave to your history, at least not full-time slave. We all know how hard it is to change. Anyway. <laughs> So, what is the source of information to the brain? Anybody ever, you, well, movement, big, smart. <laughs> but in general, what's the source of information to the brain? Senses. Senses. S uh, uh, stimulation, right? That comes through the senses. Exactly. So, stimulation, yes, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. Stimulation alone not only is not necessarily a source of new and useful information, depends how it is applied. It can be a disruption to the ability of the brain to sort itself and put order in the disorder. That and makes sense out of nonsense, meaning uh, create more order in itself and it's in its ability to organize us. I'll, now, what happens when in, we intensify the stimulation with someone suffering spasticity post-stroke or a child with cerebral palsy? 
What happens if you take someone like uh, Tessa or somebody else had ischemic stroke, <coughs> excuse me, and the arm is kind of like over here, and you really just stimulate them very intensely. What will happen? They'll tense up more. They'll get more spastic. She says it. She says after they worked her arm up, she was really tight for a long time. So what did she gain from the, the process? She gained something. The arm came somewhat to life. But actually, she, she gained, so to speak, or what she learned, what was instilled in that brain after is the association between intention to use the arm and spasticity. Because the brain learns its experience. It doesn't learn what we want it to learn. Anybody has figured out that when you try to teach people something specific, they're not necessarily going to learn that? Anybody had kids, students, <laughs> neighbors? Yeah? Yeah? You're going to get some tricks how to make it work better. What? Oh, good. <laughs> good. Yeah. It's, it's actually very, very serious. As Ali said she's here because of speech. The first time I confronted the question of being able to speak or not being able to speak was when I worked with a child. I, just start, I started working with children just for whatever reason. I didn't intend to or think of it. And, I, and I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not trained as a PTOT or anything like that. My background is clinical psychology, a, a, a background degree in statistics, and... Um, you know, and dance, right? I was also a dancer. So, but the kids started coming, and I went like, okay, and how am I going to help this child, right? So they brought the child, Cyril Posse, lovely boy, three years old, very limited, very spastic, very limited in his ability to move. <laughs> and and um, oh, you're with him? Oh, okay, okay. Very limited in his ability to move, and doesn't really speak. He understood language very well, but he couldn't coordinate the movement of speech. So, so the parents told me that what they do to help the child try to get him to speak, they were told to take his tongue and brush it intensely. I don't know, once a day, twice a day, I don't know, but that's what they did. First of all, I just cringed. You know, I thought, if anybody did that to me, that would feel horrible, which is important to know, by the way, how things feel matter. We have in our system to, the ability to feel pain all the way to pleasure. And it is actually important to notice it. It's not there by chance. It's information to the system. And when we go to the pain, fear, suffering, the whole way the brain works alters. And it's really important to understand the difference and to take advantage and work with the brain in a brain-friendly way, right? And so I thought... This is a really stunning because if you know how the brain is built, you excite the largest representation in the motor cortex and the sensory cortex. That's the tongue. And by the way, the tongue of that child got plenty stimulation. No lack of stimulation. It just didn't, wasn't unable to organize it into specific movements ends up being language, right? Speech. So I told them to please stop doing it immediately because every time they did it, what happened? There's an overflow in the brain, and anyway, there's an injured part, so there isn't the formation of, a, 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 you know, um, inhibition, proper inhibition and in, in excitation in the brain. So the whole thing just contracts like crazy. So that's kind of like the idea. So what happens? That's what happens. Increased plasticity throughout the body, further loss of differentiated function. So rather than increasing differentiation, you're reducing differentiation. That means regression, the opposite of what is needed to progress. What is needed beyond stimulation for the brain to generate new information? So that's a question. We need stimulation, but what do we need to do or what has to happen? That's a big question. The perception of a difference. Stimulation, the 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 impact of the sensations coming through the different senses, including the proprioceptive one, need to be delivered or received by the brain in a way that the brain perceives differences within the stimulation, within the flow of stimulation. That means that when I move my arm, if I do it very tough and abruptly and so on, 
I have no idea what I'm doing, but if I can somehow get to move it, and I feel, oh, it's moving a little here, it's moving a little there, even if I don't have the language or the clear, then immediately the brain starts to use, that's the information. It's what's called in information sciences, in neuro, uh, 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 neurosciences research that they look into, it is the signal-to-noise ratio. You need to have the signal sufficiently far from the background noise, meaning the activity in the brain, for the, the, there to be something that the brain starts working with. So in a sense, the brain generates the information. I said that to Michael Merzenich, he's the father of neuroplasticity, science, you know, field. And we are, he read my book. Anyway, we, we're collaborating, we're friends now, we talk, we discuss, we dispute, we, everything. One of the reasons he says he likes me is because I'm Israeli and I'm not afraid to tell him what I really think. <laughs> so, uh, and, and the, and, I, and he, t he talked about stimulation information. I said to him, Mike, stimulation information are not the same. Not necessarily the same. And he went like, woof, 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 woof. like a big guy. And I, and I went like, I could have like, but I said, no, I mean, I'm working with people. I know. I know what happens when I do A, and I know what happens when I do B. So how, what, what we really need to do is to facilitate for the brain to perceive differences. After a stroke, the system is devastated. It's in shock, it's, it, but it starts reorganizing itself right away with what it has. So, what's this? Those of you who were in the other presentation or no, don't say. Anything is true because this is not a real thing. So, hey you guys, I know you're Canadians, but what do you think this is? Talk. What? Rectangles. Rectangles. Okay. Anything else? What? Lego. Lego. Anything else? Both. Thank you. Anything else? It's anything you want. This is highly undifferentiated. Three shapes, right? Rectangles. So it's like somebody saying, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, good morning, how are you doing? I said, whoa, But the way I said it, it just, whoa, 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 whoa. it's undifferentiated, right? So, and that's when Tessa spoke, and you saw when he moved her earlier, and she could talk, but she still got stuck, and she didn't know, and the arm movement got all excited, and so on. So, what is this? More rectangles. That means you t it's the same surface, by the way. We kept the same surface. It, we don't change the size, you know, the surface itself. It's just broken down or differentiated into more pieces. And that, I like it like that because this represents that the process of learning and change is messy. Very important, especially people who work with patients. It doesn't go from I can't to I can. It goes from a more freedom and more differentiation, but it's not enough differentiation yet, and it's not integrated into anything. So as we progress to our new level, like I worked for years with many, you know, very high, I worked with the San Francisco Symphony musicians and with the people that were like world-renowned soloists and so on. They always come to me because they have issues. But I wouldn't work with them before they had to play a concert. Because I messed up with how they used to do it. They had a problem because of the way they held the violin or sang or played the piano. They did most of it really, really well. That's why they were playing Carnegie Hall. But some of it in the learning process got in the way. So that needed to change. But you change one element in the way a pianist plays the piano, guess what? The whole thing is out of whack for them for a while. So what I did is I would take them offline at a time they were not going to perform, had them sign and agree that they're not going to practice at home because they get really anxious, because they think if they don't practice for five and a half days, they will lose their ability. I said, if you lose it in five days, give up on your profession now. <laughs> so 
So the thing is, and then let them start playing one minute at a time, two minutes at a time. When we work with a stroke patient, when they can do something new, we let them do it once, maximum twice, and say, stop doing it, don't do it anymore. Because what happens when you uh, fatigue the, the system? What does it do immediately? It regresses. It goes to what it did before, what's more deeply grooved in, and at this point, it's the limited new ways are more grooved in, less differentiated, easy for the system to produce than the more highly new ways. So one of the things, you can take a trick, you work with someone, do it once, twice, three, and move away from it. It feels off in the beginning because it feels like you're not doing anything. What's this? Duck. It's a duck. Now, could it be a, a shape of a cat? If you took all those pieces, sure. Could it be a shape of a little simple tree? Yeah, could, it could be anything. Could you do an ABC from this? ABCD? Yeah. That's how the system works. We don't learn the thing and then that pattern is in the brain and then we take the whole pattern and use it. We have, it's very dynamic, it has the differentiation and paths that are more inclined to happen because they happened before and it pulls itself together and then it stops and does the next thing. I'm saying gazillions of different words expressing different thoughts, different ideas, and I don't have every thought, every idea, every sentence pre-programmed. I'm generating as I go along, but I have propensities, I have inclination. If I had to speak in Chinese now, I'd be lost, right? Because I don't. Here we go. That is when it's really highly differentiated, then it's integrated, it's seamless. So if you're a ballerina and you, you know, you do, a, 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 you turn on the tip of the toes, it's automation. That's when it's automated, when it's there, it's done, and you can just do it without even thinking. Movement and learning. The human form affords us a huge range of movement possibilities. Very important. Very, very, very many different kinds of movements. All voluntary, intentional movement has to be learned. And we have to remember that everything we do, doesn't matter what, was learned. Being bipedal requires an enormous amount of computations with high levels of complexity and agility. Very, very, very complex. So complex that no matter how much they've worked till now on, on uh, robots, and they do amazing stuff with the robots, to get them to move smoothly and really look like a human being? Uh-uh. Not there yet. Uh, high levels of neural complexity leads to freedom, adaptability, inventiveness, and the ability to generate solutions instantly. Here we go again. Anyway, the thing that's important is that it's the complexity, it's the sufficient differentiation that allows for us to do what we do. So when someone had a stroke, and you say that's what they did with Tessa, when someone had a stroke, and loss, so the, the first thing they do, they start getting her to walk and move the leg for her and walk in a standing position. Let me say something very clearly. Between doing what they did and doing nothing, what they did is infinitely better. There, I, if you said the only thing that Tessa could have gotten is that, I'd say take it with all your might, because without it, it would have been a whole lot worse. However, what it represents, putting her upright and having her do it, is skipping the process that the child does, creates underlying neural networks that allow the child eventually to get up and stand up. Children don't learn to stand and walk standing and walking. We learn to stand up lying down. We learn to stand up crawling. We learn to stand up sitting. We learn to stand up all the things we do in between that allow and afford us all of a sudden, initially in a very kind of clumsy way, but to be up. You take somebody who had a stroke, they can't stand up because they, or, you know, walk, because they lost a chunk of those underlying neural networks. And it's even worse than that because the brain integrates itself it, repeatedly, just under a tenth of a second, the whole system integrates itself. Otherwise, we couldn't have continuous uh, function. So what you do is when you lose a portion, you also 
everywhere else in the brain lost the relationship to that portion. So you lose a whole lot more than just the actual thing that was lost, the area that was lost. Functionally, you lose the whole, and that's what she experienced. She said, I'm not just knew what my body, how things relate to, yeah, that is what I do, you know, but she felt it. And what was the first most obvious outcome to her? We won't have time to show you the little videos, many of them, of the progression. We have those, but it's too much. The ringing in the ear. Guess what? I didn't even know she had ringing in the ear. She, she, nobody told me. But I knew she had ringing in the ear because she was so excited when it was gone. And how soon did she get rid of her uh, brace? After two days? Yeah. Within the first two or three days, she got rid of the brace because she started feeling parts of her right side. And the brace all of a sudden inter interfered in her ability to walk. Okay? It's an hour. Okay, I have to get going. I'm going to move. The underlying process of learning. Discrimination, differentiation, and integration. How we learn. Learning requires the f three things. Discrimination, noticing the existence of one thing versus the other thing. That's the perception of differences, one of the levels. So a baby perceives, first all the fingers move together, there's some random twitching, so they don't move all together all the time. And also the child notices that and feels that that is a thing and it's not everything else. And what do they do? They start pointing. And they love it. Because they also get people respond to it. So it's like pushing the blocks, right? Get an outcome. Differentiation. Exploration of different relationships between multiple thing one and thing twos through movement variation and their associated sensation leading to the progressive creation of new, more refined and complex functions through the creation of new connections in the brain, which leads to increased density of representational mapping of those areas in the brain. Integration, spontaneously pulling together some of the differentiated distinctions at any given time and forming a recognizable new pattern. Integration is spontaneous on the part of the patient. You cannot make somebody integrate something that they don't integrate themselves. So what I say is we have enormous say in the process. We have enormous opportunities in the process. But then we see what the client does with it. We increase the probability. You see my statistics background? We increase the probability, the likelihood that certain integrations will happen. But you, I know in my bones that there is no way I can make anybody do anything or feel anything or think anything unless I bring it to the point where they go like, oh, I can do it. You know, and it happens. And sometimes it happens. They don't even know that it's happening. They just do it. Okay? Movement learning and development. I am going to skip the milestone. Cyprus, born, so we'll show you now a child who had a very severe, devastating um, basal ganglia damage at birth, was resuscitated twice. Horrible prognosis, again, for a very good reason. Within the known way of interacting with a child like that and trying to help a child like that, he had a pretty poor prognosis. Mostly wouldn't walk, wouldn't talk, wouldn't this, wouldn't that, so on and so forth. And by the way, it's not just if you walk or you talk. It's the quality with which you do it. When we, we're working on research proposal with this colleague from Harvard, and we looked at what people define as success in rehab. And one of the things that became so clear was, that's why it's in here, the quality. So people walk, but it's kind of like this, versus the way Tessa not walks. You can still see she had a stroke, but that level of differentiation, now she's able to lie on, we won't have time to show you, lie on the floor, roll to the side, bend the legs, bring the head forward, and come up to standing all in one move. You've never seen a, a stroke survivor like her do that. It's that incredible level of differentiation, the density that has happened. So here is, we, we, we just show it. His parents were repeatedly, he would never walk, talk, wheelchair, etc. Uh, we began working with him nine months, at which time he had very limited movement and had not rolled over and extremely spastic. I remember working with him. His 
uh, adductors um, too, but his uh, flexors were just tight, 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 and were like that. You had to break his spine if you wanted to elongate the spine, which of course we wouldn't do. And Neil gave him his first session where he rolled over, and this is it. And just watch it, there's no words, you know, except towards the end you can put the sound on. So that's, that's the two and a half years. So you don't think this thing happens in one minute. He's, okay, so this, look what happens just trying to feed him. Look at the reflex reactions. Oh, just awful. And you see the child wants the food. It's not like he doesn't want to. See, the first time his chin is into the thing, and I ask the mother to kiss him, just like the blocks. Get an outcome from doing it. She kisses him rolling back. I do a few movements just to waken up the lower back a little bit. Doesn't matter here. And look how much higher the head was. Just a second. That's how quickly things shift. Here I'm showing a student. That's in the training program. And look how he's still limited with the arms. I mean, he's doing so much better, but he's just still. And look here, when he crawls, it was difficult to be on all four. He went down, look, the arms, the, especially the wrists and the hands are still like, like that. And you see the mouth still contorts, a bit like he has, as if he has a little torticollis anyway. There we go. But look at the clarity of intentionality. He's trying to touch the father's camera lens. And look how he feels slowed himself down, and figured out how to do it. It's phenomenal. This is Neil, of course. And look still how hard he's still flexing. Every time he tries to do something, the flexors kick in, and it really inhibits his ability to do stuff. But here, look how different he is already. You see, when a uh, gentle tried to take the leg back, he can't, you have to do that, you know, to be able to really stand up. It doesn't lend itself in the hip joint, but it's really the coordination with the lower back and the neck that is, does not, the brain still doesn't know to, to, to do that. So he's like this, you can't, you can't get straight. It's not the legs that can't get straight, it's, it's the coordination through the system. And now look here, look, it's a... You see, he gets up, he still gets on the top of the foot, he corrects the foot. Look how nice the feet are moving, the, some of the toes are curled at this moment. And look how his hands, as he, Neil had the, you know, the big deal with Neil here, he leaves him alone. He doesn't help him, he doesn't correct him, because he can self-correct. If you look at the child, look how he stands up better and better, talks the whole time. The mother says, now he won't stop talking. And look how... You see, the interaction with the walker gets him to have to do it more accurately. It's perfect. And he has the underlying neural networks to do it. If he didn't, he wouldn't be, we wouldn't let him now talk. Two you You see, he still has the capacity to flex, but he has the option not to. You wanna jump? Okay. And his diction, oh yeah. Still very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and now look at his focus. Oh, right. Beautiful. Look at the focus. Nobody's clapping because everybody's trained not to do that. Oh, I'm yours. Okay. So now we show he's now nine years old. Watch him climbing off some structure, you know, there are trains there and that. We try to get the parents to not respond to words that are not pronounced more clearly and couldn't get them to do it. I wanted it to fail so his brain would look to do it better, but so 
So I, will, I gave in. I said it was beyond my ability to control. Look how uses the lower back. You see? So now the brain is navigating these complex movements beautifully. So that's a brain that knows how to do it. A brain that knows how to do this can learn a whole lot of stuff. Because it's a brain that knows how to do this stuff. It's a good learning brain. He receives occasional lessons, mainstreams, uh, runs. I mean, he's doing really well. Potent recovery from stroke requires the same processes as does successful learning and development in children. Very, very important. I think that will be the place where there'll be a huge breakthrough, can be potentially a huge breakthrough in rehab for stroke patients. Infants and young children have a remarkable rate of growth and connections and structuring of the brain that is well known and associated with an enormous amount of learning. We know that. We all know that. Research shows that immediately post-stroke, there is dramatically intensified neuroplasticity. I didn't know that. I just kept saying for years, the brain learns its experience. So if somebody had a stroke, and when they try to move, the arm does that, and you tell them to try and reach, and the arm does that, within two, three uh, 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 experiences, the brain is already patterning that, even though it's undesirable. How many of you would have liked to get rid of certain habits or ideas or beliefs you have? Raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, you're not alive. <laughs> so we can't tell the brain, you know, make these connections, don't make that connections. We, we are impacted by our experience. My Israeli accent is because I was born in Israel. If I was born in France, I'd have a French accent. If I was born here, you know, if I was born in Alabama, I'd have an Alabama accent. If I was born in whatever, you know, South, uh, whatever. So, uh, uh, so I always said, don't ask people to do what they can't do because they will learn their failure. They will learn their failure. We can't not, it doesn't matter how well we mean, doesn't matter how hard everybody's working. So we have to back off and go to where they're at. So with Tessa, if you saw the first session, which they showed me working with her and she was having pain and a spasm, she, I put her lying down. I cannot get anything to change with her standing up. It's already built in. It's done. And now she's had also two months of therapy. I can't, she can't change it in standing. It's not me can't change it. She can't. So I put her lying down. And within two days, she's walking without a brace. I didn't tell her to take the brace off. You know, and she, she's also young and ambitious and athletic. And so, so she did that. Research shows that immediately post-stroke, there is dramatically, so it's not only there is plasticity that we all know, biologically, somehow we evolved that the system, that's very recent research discovery. Uh, is it Krakauer? Yeah. yeah, it's John Krakauer from John Hopkins that did this research. He's, he's on a parallel path that we are. Like, he's, an, <clears throat> he's a neurologist, well-known neurologist in John Hopkins. And he found that. It's, he thinks it's for a month or six weeks. We think if you don't shut it down, it actually continues. We even reopened it, like with Tessa, like with other patients you will see. <clears throat> Our clinical experience shows us that neuroplasticity can be significantly intensified through neural movement well beyond the first few weeks post-stroke and as far as years later. We work with people that come to us five, seven years, and we reopen the conversation. Is it as vivid? I worked with a couple stroke patients immediately after stroke. They fully recover. I can't say that it'll happen in the future. It's a sample of two. But both of them had big time strokes. The reason they got to me is because they knew me and their family wanted me to do that. So that's how that worked. And one of them was a doctor, so he got me in because he himself was a doctor. The other one, it was in California, and I waited for the neurologist you know, that was on the floor. And I said to him, it was so funny, I said to him, you know, we do this very gentle alternative, and I was going to say what we do, I, wanted, I needed to get permission. He said, the alternative, not a problem, do it. Walked away, he was busy. I said, okay. <laughs> Our clinical experience, yeah, okay. We have found that we can wake up neuroplasticity as much as six or more years of post-stroke. Function is not a thing. Shifting from static mechanical model to a complex dynamic model, to the extent that functions such as sitting, standing, balancing, and speaking are perceived as unitary, rehab therapists may try to have the patient recreate them directly in their entirety up front. That's what I've been already referring to. This misses the opportunity to approach the system as it truly functions. I have a huge number of dynamically interrelated subcomponents. 
and intercrossing between functions that precede the emergence of loss disrupted or new functions. Anybody? I mean, you can. I'll, I'll leave time for Q and A, but this is it. You're getting like the core of everything. Neuroplasticity, positive or negative utilization and outcomes. The brain is a self-organizing system. That's why you can't make it do anything. It has to do it itself. And will immediately begin reorganizing itself after the stroke for better or for worse. So it's the good news and it's the good news because if we know that, we have choices. Any experience the, therap the patient has through the rehab intervention will either promote, renew the differentiation and increase the probability that the patient will regain loss function, positive neuroplasticity, or actually reduce the pro probability of such outcomes, negative, what I call negative neuroplasticity. The neuroplasticity is, new, is, is, uh, is neutral. It's just what it is. But the negative is positive is what we want it to do. Okay. Uh, when patients is asked to try and to do what they cannot do yet, their need to intense prior for intense prior differentiation and for the formation of necessary underlying neural networks. Okay, I'll skip that. Um, skip that. Uh, this is a very short video. I'd like you to see. He's a guy who came to us six years after. Yes. Six years. And 57 at the time, 57 years old. Uh, like, same, similar to Tessa, you know, uh, left side, ischemic stroke, right arm. You'll see what happened. I mean, I actually, I discovered it, so you can discover it by watching the video. Oh, came to IBM at age 57, was six years old, left side of ischemic stroke, symptoms on arrival at IBM Neuro Movement Center, marked aphasia, no sensation on right side, including right arm, no use of right arm or hand, inability to balance on right leg, significant limping while walking, enormous efforts in execution of any intentional action. Now I use less effort. A little louder. Less effort. See, Neil tells him to use less effort. Less effort. Yeah. Less effort. We have to teach them to just don't try so hard. Close your eyes. Just imagine doing it. It goes all the way to imagination. Very powerful tool. See, what Neil is doing is he's only lifting it to the point that he doesn't get the spastic reaction. It takes a few years to be trained to be able to do that, to really feel it and really match with what the patient is doing. You see, now he's starting to bring in, because for the arm to move forward, move your arm forward and reach forward, the sternum has to do something, the ribs have to do something, lower back. Yes. Yeah, okay. And you felt it also immediately after the stroke, do you remember? No, never, never yeah. felt anything. You didn't feel anything after the stroke? Never. Uh, when did it come, the feeling? Tell you too. This week. This week? Wow. I was so surprised. Wow. He hasn't felt the oh, right shit. arm. He hasn't felt the right arm. I asked him, what do you feel? I mean, it's the first time I'm working. He says, what do you feel? I said, I'm... And then I say, he feels it. I said, when did you feel it? Since the stroke? He said, no, since when? He said, since this week, the first week he was with us. Six years later. Isn't it awesome? OK. I'm going to skip. You're not getting a movement lesson. No time. OK, so how do we do that? What are the brain-friendly conditions to promote what we call positive neuroplasticity, positive brain change? Actually, Norman Deutsch, he came for five years to observe me work with certain children and wrote about it in his second book and took one of my essentials for his actually two, two or three actually, but one very clearly by named it the same way, one of the essentials in his general theory of, he, uh, he tried himself to create a general theory of neuroplasticity, a positive brain change, which is the learning switch, but the nine essentials. Movement with attention, learning switch, I won't read them. Uh, so many years working with adults and children with transformational outcomes that were not supposed to happen, I kept asking myself, 
What is happening in the brain? So I got the results and I said, what is happening? Why is it working? What about what I do works? I didn't think I got Jesus' hands. I didn't think whatever. So it's like, what is, wh I wanted to know, so I clean out all the mysticism and all the I'm special or any of that stuff. The nine essentials are the eventual answer. They are now validated by brain plasticity research. I didn't build them from research. When I wrote my first book, Neil was my research guy, and I said, I said, I said go out and see if they, whoever they is, have already figured out that, oh, yeah, the one, anything that I was talking about. Scientists have defined the rules. That's uh, Michael Merzenich again of brain plasticity, and Adbaniel working in parallel along a completely different path, has defined the almost exactly the same rules and interprets them in practical and understandable human terms as the nine essentials that should contribute richly to clinical intervention. Uh, this is phenomenal for me, that, because I know that, but he actually realized that, and so it goes. So the first one is movement with attention. The attention is not to the teacher, to the instructions, or to any of that, even though you want some of it. If you say somebody, do lift your arm, so hopefully they heard and understood. But it's the attention of what I feel as I move, what I feel as I move. Because without the feeling of self, that's also emergency related research, actually that's how we first got connected that way, is that without it, there is no recognizable change in the density of the mapping of the area that's moving to the brain, which is what the baby does, you know, when they grow. They map themselves. We form ourselves. And if there's a tension to it, there is a rapid, rapid change. We'll get to it. Nothing happens until something moves. Einstein, movement is life. Without movement, life is unthinkable. Moshe Feldenkrais, he was my teacher in addition to what I did, and I was, worked with him closely, traveled with him, and took what I learned from him, and here we are today. Movement is the language of the brain. That's something I coined years ago because I felt like I'm talking to the brain. I'm communicating because I get, I get a response. It's like dancing. I'm back and forth, back and forth. Okay, this is a, a Daniel Walpert of... Cambridge is a movement neuroscientist. This is a TED Talk. We cut it down to a very short thing. Watch the whole TED Talk. Really, really worth it. I'm a neuroscientist. And in neuroscience, we have to deal with many difficult questions about the brain. But I want to start with the easiest question. And the question you really should have all asked yourself at some point in your life, because it's a fundamental question if we want to understand brain function. And that is, why do we and other animals have brains? Not all species on our planet have brains, so if we want to know what the brain is for, let's think about why we evolved one. Now, you may reason that we have one to perceive the world or to think, and that's completely wrong. If you think about this question for any length of time, it's blindingly obvious why we have a brain. We have a brain for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex movements. There is no other reason to have a brain. Pretty intense. 1.8 million new connections per second estimated when we are in a true learning mode. About a billion a minute. The non-duality of movement and cognition. I'm not going to show you. This is a girl with scoliosis, 10 years old. Not only she didn't need surgery after working with us intensely for a month, but... She joined the basketball team, and the mother says, oh, and by the way, now she's getting A in math. I said, what did she get before? She said she failed. So we see that all the time, the non-duality of cognition and movement, that means cognition emerges from the process of movement, the differentiation, organization of movement. Uh, the next essential is slow. Fast, we can only do what we already know. Anybody who knows any, you know, about the brain, we, we form those connections. There's the process of myelination that speeds up the, the, the passage of the electric current. And the more we do something and repeat, the deeper it gets grooved in. And the more, if we're going to try and do it, we will default into what there is already. So if we try to move fast, to do something fast, whether... 
It's something, and being able to move fast is very important. But this is later, as you refine it and repeat it until it, and by the way, there moves to a different area in the brain once it's automated. But I think something is now making noise on my part. Anyway, so when we work with anyone and we are looking for them to be able to gain the ability to do something they don't have at this moment, really slowing down is extremely important. Extremely important. And it's counterintuitive, and it's hard to do things slow when we don't know how to do them. But if you ask somebody to do something they can't do, and you ask them to write away, like Tessa, and they put her on a wall and, and they move it for her, the brain just gathers what it has and whatever it can and does something. Or fails, completely fails. And when there's failure, it's a very bad thing because the whole system kind of weakens and retracts away from attempting it again. And then if it continues, it tends to retract globally. My daughter is very, very bright. And she had a math teacher. She was bright enough. They put her in whatever advanced math or whatever they call it in high school. Except the teacher, we went for this uh, opening evening to meet all the teachers and they talk. And I looked at this math teacher. I thought, that's a dis disaster. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's memorized math. I don't know how you do that. But he doesn't know what he's talking about. And she won't be able to work. I, know, I knew her. I said nothing. I talked to her dad, who is the professor of statistics in <laughs> Berkeley. And I said, what are we going to do about this? Anyway. Then she failed, and she went to his office hours, and she got freaked out because he just confused her more. But then, and I wanted to move her to another math, but you know, you can't because the kids signed an agreement not to leave if it gets hard. So I did what I did with the school, so they agreed to move her. But I got her a private, a, 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 because, and I knew I had to do something, because she started failing in everything, not just math. And I knew exactly what was happening. I didn't need to wait for her to be a real problem to know. So I got, I went through three uh, private tutors and found the third one. And I said, don't help her solve the problems. Don't have to help her get the homework done. Help her understand the thinking behind the math. She'll do fine. That's what happened. She became the A student in math, and then all the grades went up. We want fast. We fail people. And we get what they already have. Subtlety, that's a reduction of force. Reduction of force, if we want to feel differences, if we put a lot of intensity into what's going on, it's hard to feel a difference. A small difference cannot be perceived. You're in broad daylight, I will turn a flashlight behind you, you wouldn't know. You're in a loud room, I talk to you with the, softly, you wouldn't hear me. You're not deaf, but there is enough differential for the brain to notice an added intensity. By the way, if you pay attention, each and every one of those essentials is a mechanism to promote and facilitate perception of differences. And it's what all children do when they develop well spontaneously by themselves, by the way. Variation is generating differences. So rather than trying, like, putting her in a brace and trying to make her step correctly, what I do when people don't step correctly, I do many things, but one of the things I do is I say, please put the foot here. If you try just going out of here, then walk and put the foot here. And then put your arm up when you walk and walk on the heel, and then walk like that, and then walk and feel how the left foot touches the floor versus the right. I feel the difference right now. It's all it takes. It's so simple, it drives me crazy. I mean, so I, I used to work in Tango Music Festival, and I, you know, and I work with large numbers of people, and I felt like I'm cheating. Because what I asked them to do was so basic, but it worked. They stopped getting, lots of them used to get the injuries. I'm not going to do Zakayo. There's a lot I'm not going to do. Oh, this is just a child that, uh, um, Neil, can you speak that part about Zakayo? Do we have a slide? Okay. I want Isaac. Okay. Uh, uh, the, 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 can you say just a few words yeah. about him? We have a slide. Oh, we have a slide. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, go back, go back, go back. Okay. okay. Uh, April, uh, should I do him or Zakai? Which one? Okay, April 19th, at four weeks old, admitted to Lucille Packard with inter in intracranial bleed, acute and chronic component, left subdural hematoma with evidence, da da da. Awful. 
okay? This charge on Capra after two weeks, started ABM in August 3rd, so I don't know how long it was, a few months later. Dire prognosis, never will turn to right, never will walk, never, no, 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 real bad. This is how his brain looked. Neil, you, do you want to say a word about what they're seeing? <laughs> well, I think they know what they're seeing. I mean, all this white blob here is blood. Okay. Or clot. Blood clot, big blood clot. Child video, Isaac. Should I move it? No. It is going. That's just a still photo of him immediately post op. This is him when he came home. So yeah, uh, you need to take him back to food. People can't see. No, no, no. Take him back. Huh? Go. Go. Say go. So this is when he first came home. So this is. After he started with us, he started to roll over, but you can still see that his, his right hand is plastic, and this is him just a couple of about a month ago. Whoops, I have to catch you again. Come to me. Here's your mommy. Here's your daddy. Mommy's going to pick you up. Isaac is doing absolutely amazing. He's, he is. He's doing really, really well, aren't you? You said five new words yesterday with Michelle, didn't you? And, and we went to my sister's church, and uh, they had a, a speaker from Africa who came and said, in Africa, whenever somebody says amen, you say hallelujah. And I, that's a hard word, I think, to say. Hallelujah, yes. Yes. And so he, in the middle of the service, he goes, hallelujah, as loud as he could. Oh, it was so sweet. Oh, so funny. Okay. All right, then moving on. What happens when we oppose these essentials? That means the way we in, in, interact with the client, or pay, we call them clients, but you call them patients, uh, often by asking the stroke victim, adult or child, to do upfront what they should be doing but can't yet. And to do it mechanically rather than with attention, to self, feeling of self, fast rather than slow, crudely rather than with subtlety and with great effort and even pain. They experience suffering and failure and they learn their limitation. They very quickly help train them into their failures and limitations. I tried to explain that to, to, to the, at the time, the head doctor of all Kaiser, you know, doctors in the US, 15,000, nice men. And another doctor that was in charge of research uh, for Kaiser, evidence-based research, wanted to introduce me to him with the hope that we could do research on that in Kaiser. And, and I said to him at a certain point, I said, look, the reason you get patients into rehab in Kaiser, is be, I talk about stroke, is because they had a stroke. The reason they have the limitations that present when they're in their rehab uh, center is because they had a stroke. The reason you can, they leave predictably roughly between three to five weeks later with minimal progress after that is because of the intervention. It's easy to assign it to the stroke because the stroke is a devastation and the initial issues are due to the stroke. But the intervention uh, assures the ceiling, the very predictable ceiling we see across all those ischemic stroke patients with variability. The degree of the stroke, the age, there are other medical conditions and so on and so forth. When ha what happens when we do follow these essentials? We get the back breakthrough outcomes that are far beyond what we usually expected. Uh, we begin discovering the realm of possibilities. We can begin imagining a whole new paradigm for rehabilitation. That is what we are after. Not ourselves, but just out there in the world. Tessa, not going to show you. Raymond, we've shown you. Um, that next essential, flexible goals, extremely important. We do have a goal, a big goal. We have a goal to get that person as fully functional and in life. Look at Tessa last week did five evenings. She, they found her on Facebook, some kind of medical company device, something or other. They saw this video that you saw. And she was paid to do public speaking. Isn't that ironic or interesting? public speaking in schools for stroke awareness. Five different times she spoke publicly, just last week. So we have the goal, but I am not 
enslaved by the goal. I am free. I am free to see what the, the, the client can do, see where they're at, start working based on those principles from where they're at, and then move with them as they change, and then they surprise me and we go else. I mean, Jill Bolte Taylor said to me, she's going to become a public speaker. I don't know if you know, she's watched her TED Talk, if you haven't, my stroke of insight. She said she'll be a public speaker. I said, okay, Jill, thanks. You know, I mean, I went to my head, really. Here she is, a public speaker. Damn, Jill, I hate not being right. <laughs> Enthusiasm. Jill is off. Up. Enthusiasm is not clapping. It's not saying, hey, hoorah, rah, 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 you can do it. It's the ability to internally amplify and take deep satisfaction in the changes that you perceive in your patient. Rather than trying to get a big outcome in order to be, I really love for that to go away. They're working on it. Rather than needing a big change in order for you to feel, to notice the difference, you become the amplifier for your patient by you perceiving small differences. The finer differences you can perceive, the more impactful you'll be on your patient. The reason to date, I still, not all the time, but some of the time get more potent out, or my clients get more potent outcomes than with my amazing practitioners that get these amazing outcomes is because I have had more time to train myself to perceive differences even finer than they do. That's the main reason why I get better outcomes. It's not because I'm smarter, trust me. Not that. So that, but so when you're, you you take a, a patient away from this really big difficulty because the the brain just goes and I'm going to fall down and they, that's what they learn. They say, oh, this is not walking, and they don't like doing it. They don't they don't initiate movement because it's too hard. But if I put them lying down and I get to move their pelvis a little and their chest and connect those two together very gently, and usually in the beginning they just feel better and they don't know what's happening. It's too, they're still too diffuse. But anyway, enthusiasm, the learning switch. We're either in a learning mode or not. If we're too tired, if we're sick, if we, we, we've already had 10, 15 minutes of, of therapy and we've changed, time to stop. The brain is 15 minutes maximum. Research from Jerusalem University, maximum. Take a break, do something else. By the way, I have a slide later on on that. I won't get to it probably. <coughs> Sleep. When you do an effective 10, 15 minutes of therapy, your patient needs to eat and sleep. And in the beginning, they may sleep for seven, eight, nine hours. They shouldn't be interrupted unless medically necessary. Read the stroke, my stroke of insight if you haven't. What her mother did is she pulled her out of rehab because she saw how they kept waking her up and she got agitated. She's a mathematician. And she just connected to her child, who was 37 years old at the time. And Jill would sleep up to, I think, 12 hours after 10 minutes of working with, with her mom. She slept most of the time. She healed fully. And the kids we work with, the adults we work with, they eat more, they sleep more. With Tessa, you know, She's young, so people thought they'll entertain her while she was... I got one of our practitioners to have her stay with her. And I said, feed her and give her a bed. I want her sleeping. Because every time they, you know, they exhausted... Oh, it takes real understanding, real awareness, and then real high-level human intentional action. Inhibit our introduction to Frank. We can't do... This is unbelievable. It's a man with a devastating stroke. Nothing. This is a father. We, can't, we don't have time. I didn't know if it was going to change. I said, you guys tell the, the parents. We don't, they, had to, they have a machine that picks him up and put him, you know, he's just like nothing. The, the, changes, are, the changes in the man are just remarkable. Last Sunday, I just saw him myself for the first time. He's been with us for a few months. He sang in the church. In the, I mean, they sing something. I don't know what they sing. I'm Jewish. But he, he sang with them. We won't do that. 
we won't do that. That imagination, you saw Neil use it, dreams, very important as they start progressing for the patient to have a dream of something they care for, they want to be able to get to. Then the changes even accelerate more. And sometimes it sounds completely ridiculous. Working with a CP adult woman that wanted to become a dancer. Every fiber in my body wanted to tell her, no, you can't do that. Guess what? I didn't. Guess what? She got to dance. She, she danced and she found places to dance. And when you do it in the context of the person's subjective, real dream, the brain takes it, feeds it into the dream. Everything, every piece of information gets organized towards the dream. I say dreams pull us from our future. <laughs> Awareness, extremely important, the glue of learning. I won't go any further. What is possible for Q&A, guys? You have buttons. What? Oh. Hand-offs. I, I, I have to go out of my little square. <laughs> hey, and okay, so, you know, hi. I just wanted to say hi. Uh, Megan and I came to join your talk today, so thanks for sharing with us. It's great to see you guys, and we just wanted to let everyone know that um, you do a great job at what you do. So thanks for sharing. Oh, okay, thanks. That was not too much information, but thank you. Thank you. No, you, you tell them about Megan. You, Neil, take a microphone and tell. Here we go. Um, yeah, no, I don't know if you guys can see close enough, but Megan um, was in our hospital here and spent quite a few months um, on 6300. So, Megan, I'm sure everyone can see you now. So, and then um, her and her mom, they went, and Logan went down to California to see you, not Neil. So, yeah. thank you, do Megan. Do you want to say a few things what she's doing that she could, like two things she couldn't do before? Otherwise, people don't know what to look at. Um, well, she can do lots and lots of things that she um, couldn't do before. But I think basically, um, you're talking about recognizing her body and being able to understand how it moves. I think, you know, you guys had taught her a lot of, of how to, to feel her body and, and to not push. Can you, can you, can you just name, name two things that she can do better that she couldn't do before? Your, just two. Your arms, probably. Arms. Movement and, movement and using her arms much better and walking softer, maybe. Her OT is here with us, too. Okay, the OT wants to say anything? Hi, OT, you must have a name, but... That's <laughs> cool. You're doing your ponytail on the side, doing housework. Oh, okay. She's doing yard work. She's doing, okay, we got that. Yard work, housework, right, May? Everything, yeah. She's now working for me. I try. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you very much. And hi, Megan, nice to see you. All right. Oh, yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Okay, we're going to pass a, a, in each row, it's going to get, I hope each row is going to get, thank you, a form that you can sign, put your name. If you want any of those things, write your email, but really clearly so we don't miss it. And either if you want to try those movement lessons, we have 40 different movement lessons online, about five to seven minutes each. We call it Neuro Movement for the Busy Life. And... Uh, and uh, you can do the movements yourself. You can use it with different patients, if you like, or bits and pieces, either by showing them the recording or by... You, you can do with it what you want, and you can experience the work for yourself. We've done it for people using computers and so on for pain. And then uh, you say, if you're interested in uh, the, our practitioner training program, if yes, we'll send you information, and if you want our newsletter. Okay? So thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Now, question from the audience, comments, anything? You guys, just listen so attentively. You must have something. I have a question. Good. Um, did, you do the, did you do the button? Yeah. 
my partner Chuck is dead. Oh, wow. Awesome. Um, I'm working with someone that has left, they had a left-sided stroke, and their weakness is resolved, but their left vision is gone still, currently. Uh, we're working on stairs with a cane, and the other day the OTs were having them try to lead with their cane and then try to walk. And they were not going slow, they were going fast, and they're going to fall, basically, if I don't intervene. What I'm looking at is for working with them this week, should we take their cane away and try to work with just the rails and see how well they direct themselves and try to lead their, their foot down the stairs, or should we continue with the cane as a extension of their leg and try to work with that for their mobility to go down the stairs? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Thank, thank you for it. What's your name? Clay. Clay? Clay, Clay like the mud. Clay. You've said that before. Uh, you've got back pattern in your brain. <laughs> anyway, first of all, thank you for your question. And thank you for being open to suggestions. And I don't know if this room has a regular chair. And I'm going to demonstrate something on Neil to show you suggestions, OK? So just a regular chair. Oh, perfect. Perfect. So yeah, so a, a, this way. And take away the microphone. Here, I'll take it. I'll take it. Put it where it's safe. Okay. All right. So, so your your client, your patient, doesn't know really how to do it. He knows there are bits and pieces there. He's clumsy. The the timing of the movement, by the way, timing is so important. And in the specific, it's much harder to keep the timing. You know all that kind of stuff. The first thing I would do is not try to make him put the climb up and down stairs. That's the very first thing. The second thing is I would say, what has to happen when climbing up the stairs, right? And I will take my focus away from the legs and the feet. Because they, you could climb up stairs if you had little stumps here, right? People can be amputated and still climb up stairs using their pelvis. So what needs to happen? Certain things need to happen in the pelvis, the lower back, and the relationship between the pelvis, lower back, and what happens in between. So when you are going to climb a stair, if you just start the movement, you see, if you want to get cues as what is needed, don't do the whole movement because then it's, that's over, you know? But if you just begin bending the knee, and then you're going to lift the leg, how does, what picks up these legs? A little bit those muscles. But actually, you really want those muscles to do as little work because they're small and they'll get very tight, very spastic, but there's not much control. You want the big muscles. That means the tush, the pelvis, has to actually lift up. You see, I'm picking up my leg with my pelvis. For that, my lower back has to both arch, and this has to get shorter, right? And the head has to actually move a little forward, right? So I do, it's a very complex movement. So what I do here, I would either put him lying down. I don't have a table, so I'm not going to do lying down. I'm going to do sitting and sitting. I would put a pillow or something behind. So first of all, I'm taking away the weight, but I still, anybody has like a big sweater or something? You probably not. It's a warm day. <laughs> uh, uh, no, because it's important that you are, you are very mobile. I'm going to put the, the, this behind you. Improvisation, by the way, is a big part of this work. Okay, let's see. That will, yeah. yeah, this will be a little, here we go. This one and this one. That's it. So now, two, I, I gained two things. He's pretty upright. He's ready to mobilize in space. He's not just lounging back in the brain and says, oh, we're going to work. But on the other hand, he gets full support. You see, he doesn't have to use his back muscles. So the brain is free to do something new with those muscles. Because if you're already contracting the muscles in a certain way, this is it. It can't do anything different. It has to stop doing it to do something new. And then what I might just do is I might just, first of all, like take his head a little bit, bend it this way, and see what does he do with that little movement. I'm just doing a little movement. What does he do with that? And then I can do any number of things, but very gently I'll put my hand uh, under his pelvis, find it toward the sit bone, or you can do it on the grand trochanter or both. And I'm going to put this here and here. And I'm going to just support it very delicately. I'm not trying, because it's not going to move much, I promise you. Even with people who didn't have a stroke, most people's pelvises are sort of gone from their motor cortex and sensory cortex. Here we go. So 
and I just hold it. He feels it. And then I feel, oh, God, his ribs are doing nothing. His brain doesn't know that the ribs have something to do with it. So then I can do something like take, first of all, I want to know if that already impacted the head. And guess what? It has, it, it's genuine. He's not faking it. I'm actually stopping him from going further. So already this has changed. You know, I want to see how easily he moves forward. And then I might put my hand on his ribs and just do that a little bit. You see, now at the beginning, the first movement, the pelvis didn't move. The second movement, the pelvis is starting to move. And then I can go and I just lift the knee a tiny, start taking the weight. You see, the leg feels really heavy. If the leg feels heavy, that means that the brain is not bringing the, you see, if I lift my leg, the iliac bone should roll backwards, right? The lower back should ram. My brain is not doing it. Then, so this is this, then this becomes really heavy. You take someone who had stroke, they also have a spasticity. Oh my God, they're not doing this. They're doing this, they're doing this and they're gonna fly away, right? They can't do it. So I'm going like that. I mean, I would sit, but I don't have a chair. And I go like that. So then I can simply try to indicate to him that he has a pelvis. You have a pelvis. Very simple. It's not making him do it. It's waking up and the relationship between the part and the, in the context of this movement. So the brain is more likely to put it together. I do this. I do this. I can even do this movement of moving the arm. And if it's spastic, I don't care, whatever. I always work on the good side first, by the way. Always, always. And now there's research, finally, they show that with ischemic stroke, if they have the patient do what they're going to do with them on the affected side, first on the unaffected side, significantly better outcomes doing it first on the better side. Here's where we say, start where it works, where the brain can figure it out. So I do this, and then I go back, and by the way, look, the leg has become much lighter. The pelvis is moving. <coughs> I'm moving the arm. Don't help. You see, if he helps, I stop him. And there we go, because I want it to be the real deal. There you go. Now his sternum is moving. His arm is moving. And now I'm going like, the, oh, look at that. Now he's starting to get a real person. Yeah, not a presenter. The person that moves. Here we go. Now I can even push backwards a little so that he knows that. This, and then I go back to the pelvis. There you go, look at it. Now it starts. Not there. Now you have the option to then put your patient, if they can, comfortably. If it's not comfortable, don't tell them you're teaching them how to go upstairs. Don't even mention it. Because their representation of what it means to go upstairs is so cockamamie right now. We don't want to associate it together. You know it in your head. And they will feel better. They will breathe better. It always makes people feel better. So I put, if they're ready, I'll put in. If you can't just the other end, fine. Lean. And then lean on that leg, uh, you know, uh, uh, which way that. So I would, uh, I might even put my hand to support or put my hand under the uh, sit bone. And I will go now, and you have them do this. You say, do this. Now move your leg a little over here. Feel, you know, you get them to crawl, you know, to do some movements. You don't, and then of course you can put a little stool and say, don't do it right away. And then you put the stool and just bring a little weight onto the stool. Take this, you see, you build the underlying capabilities. Does that help you? Just have a burst of imagination. Use it, you know, because, and do it slow. Gentle, not many repetitions. Many repetitions is a form of forcing. Trying to make it happen, you know. Just gentle. People get better. They just do. We're very spoiled because it just works. Doesn't mean they will be able to climb stairs right away. Doesn't mean that they will ever be able to climb stairs, but it increases the probability they will. And the process is safe. Safety for the brain is number one. Survival for the brain is number one. Stroke, no stroke. And mama is no mother. It doesn't matter what the condition is. Safety, safety, safety. If there's a sense of compromised safety, 
the, the, the amygdala takes over, the lower centers of the brain take over, and we can't use the higher centers to override the existing limitation. Okay? Any other question? Thank you, Neil. So look, by the way, now, how much lower this shoulder is. Isn't that bizarre? I did hardly anything. Look, this side of the neck is longer. The whole right side now is more there, there, and better organized, just from just those few things. You see how much lower, and lo longer and lower. That means unnecessary tension is left, you know, whatever. Any other question? Thank you, Neil. He likes it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he's happy. He gets a little more apish, yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's what happens when we start really standing on so on, the ape brain gets included. Yes. What else? Yes, go ahead. Um, uh, my uh, button. Yeah, there we go. Done. Oh, me? Whoever is talking, just do it into the thing that they want you to do. Oh, I pushed the button. Oh. Very good. You're in there. Oh, my God. Okay, here I am. Magic. Uh, the last point, awareness. I wasn't sure, does that mean your awareness or the client's awareness? Or? Excellent question. Awareness is like the real gold part. <laughs> you know, this is like the highest utilization of the br human brain. And as far as we know, the degree to which we have awareness is a unique human quality. Both. The awareness of the therapist is, is huge. In my, my practitioner training programs, we spend a good percentage of the time taking the, the participants through the process of movements and so on, so their awareness of themselves just keeps evolving and their abilities. That's what Tessa did when she said she's doing the training. And I asked her to do the training because I thought it would be a much more efficient way to use her f financial resources, and she's not a practitioner. She's actually working with people. It's just remarkable. So, I mean, she's not quite. She's going to graduate, but she's done the practicums, and she did really well. And, and so developing your own awareness and activating. For me, awareness is not a state of mind. It's not like, oh, you know, it's like a lot of people that do spiritual stuff, kind of think of awareness as a thing that's out there, and you kind of get it infused into you from the ether. Maybe it's true, but it's not my approach. I mean, it feels wonderful, and it feels very special to, to be more and more aware. It's quite remarkable. But it's an action. Everything that the brain does is, is action. It organizes action. The brain's job is to organize action. So awareness is something we do. We, we employ it. It's like intention is an action. It's something we do. And, and so the, when we become aware, when we aware, if we do make a verb out of it, but when we become aware that like, oh my God, I feel different. This is not, oh, Oh, and in the beginning, it'll be just a general feeling if you are not ready to notice the details. And I say, oh, when I do that, oh, I feel lighter. Oh, my pain is gone when I do that. Or I can reach easier. Or I'm thinking clearer. Then you, you, you day passes or something happens, and then you go like, oh, I'm walking like this again. And you can just close your eyes and say, how was it in the morning? You have it. You don't have to go through the whole process, and it glues in the learning. It glues in the learning. It amplifies, speeds up the actual neurological processes of gluing in the learning. That's in the patient. Very hard if your client's awareness is higher than yours. You're not as useful. So I can work with, you know, concert pianists, world-renowned concert pianists, not because I play the piano like them. I don't even remotely play the piano like them. But I have an awareness. I, I, I do hear well. You know, I notice changes in the quality of music, so I can work with them also on that basis. But I see how they do it. I've, I have much bigger ability to see how they employ themselves as they produce their music, they make their music. And I can jump in and give them options and greater differentiation in areas that I feel they're under-differentiated. You see, it's chill. most I discovered for me, most of the pain, uh, performance-related injuries and all that stuff is due to insufficient differentiation. Taking the time while they were children and learning to play, taking the time 
to not, because th these people were good already as children, not pushing them to be, you know, playing the Moonlight Sonata when they're seven and a half. They can play the Moonlight Sonata when they're eight. They can play nine. What's the rush? So you give or have them play it in ways that are not right, right away, or correct right away. You let, you experiment. The way I worked with a musician, tell you a very brief story. I was in Germany, there's a world-renowned uh, cellist in one of the world-renowned qu quartets. And he was in so much pain, and that's what happens to the musicians, they can't play and they get devastated because that's their whole life. And, and so, and I had time for one session to give him. I was on, on the road. So he comes, and he's Austrian, and he's a pretty stocky guy, and he's serious, and he's kind of Austrian. You know, I didn't feel like I could joke around with him or do things like that. And, and he's in a lot of anxiety and concern, and I'm also this weird thing, doing this weird thing. He doesn't know what it is, and somebody told him he should try it, and he's so desperate, he agreed. So, so I, I first put him lying down, like I explained to you, that it's important to take away the d demands of the gravitational force. And within three minutes, I realized he was lying there and thinking, what the hell is she doing, right? There was no time for that. So I set him up. I had him take the cello. I always ask him to bring the instrument unless it's a piano. And I, I asked him to play for me, and he played the, a piece from the last, uh, the famous Schubert quintet. Yeah, wonder. I love this quintet. And he plays two or three phrases. I watch how he does it. He's obviously a fantastic musician, right? And I think, okay. I see what he does, and I go like, oh, my God, he is so grooved into the right way of playing. And he must have learned it when he was very, very young because everything is built around it. So I say, I say to him, do you mind playing to me maybe a children's song? And then I thought, you know, take the Anna Magdalena Bach and, you know, the twinkle, twinkle, little star. And he was offended. I said, I know you are a world-class musician. I said, but just for this. So he said, fine, and he played it. And, of course, he did a good job. And I said to him, now, can you play it for me badly? He couldn't compute my words. Ever since he learned to play, he was taught to play well. The, you know, not flexible goes and right away to doing the right way, whatever the teacher thought, and he figured whatever he figured. And in it was the part that made him have the pain. So I, I, he, he couldn't, he just couldn't, he couldn't play badly. By the way, this is a very, very bad, uh, compulsion is not a good thing. So I said to him, do you, do you teach little kids to play? He said, yes. I said, do you, do you have them play this? And he said, yes. I said, do some of them play badly? He said, oh, yeah. I mean, that was very clear to him. So I said, can you imitate one of them and play like one of them? And he could do that. So, and then I also moved his shoulders and head. So there was no way he was going to play it correctly because his bow arm couldn't control properly. I did it gently. You know, the bow is like a really important thing. And, you know... And, I said, and he, he played badly. I said to him, that was excellent. You did playing badly really well. He did. But that also kind of throws things around, lots of variation and changing goals and all that stuff. And then I said to him, can you play badly in another way? Now I'm getting into real business. And he, I could see the learning switch was on. He got it. He got interested. He played it badly second way, third way, fourth way. I asked him to play badly fifth way. He couldn't find it. I said, not a problem. Four times, four ways is good enough. I did a few more things with him. I gave him back the ball. I gave him the cello, and I said, now play the Schubert thing. He was pain-free, and the quality of the sound was so much better. And guess what? A musician like him, he hears it. It's the most compelling part of the whole process, more than even getting rid of the pain. So he looks at me. That was the end of the session. He says, how can I keep it? I said, you can't keep it. There's nothing to keep. I can't give it to you. It's nothing to keep. I said, you can recreate it. How do you recreate it? I said, you either feel that you're starting to go towards pain or you're getting anxious about it or even just in general. I said, choose something. Play badly. Move your shoulders around. I didn't have all my movement sets and everything. I didn't have the products to offer him at the time. 
And I sent him off his way. I never heard from him again. I, I hope it worked. But it certainly worked at that point. So that gives you an idea of the awareness. Okay? Are we done or do we have time or what's this? I mean, they look like they're not going anywhere, but we have one, more question. one more question because we started a little late. Is, did you raise your hand? No. Over there. What? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I talked to you yesterday a lot. Can I give a quick testimonial? Oh, she, she wants to give a testimonial? Yeah. Would you mind walking over here and giving the testimonial? Okay. I know it will take you a little while, so in, a question in between. <coughs> Anyone wants to ask a quick question in between? Yes, go ahead. I just have a question with uh, neonates. Uh, Sorry? If you have a neonate with severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, when is the best time to start? When Did you understand? Sorry. We can't understand the neonatal baby with yes. severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Now. Yeah, yeah now. That was, that, was, that, 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 that was, uh, uh, you come here, come here, stand where Neil is standing in front of him. I will tell conclusion and implication, the emerging understanding of the, in one second, of the role of learning and neuroplasticity on health and functioning has the potential to significantly impact medical intervention. When to start the intervention in stroke as soon as medically possible. The brain is alive and creating patterns no matter what's going on. So if it's not, I, I, anyway, I worked with one person that was on induced coma. That's the guy I worked right away. For 10 days, massive uh, brain hemorrhage both sides. They didn't even know if he'll stay alive. Never mind all the details. After four, we saw all the markers going, improving. You know, the breathing, he was on a breathing machine. He was the whole bit. And he woke up, he sat up slowly, and he talked. And he walked to the bathroom, two people on either side to make sure he doesn't fall. That's kind of like, that was pretty awesome. How to intervene, how frequently, that's, uh, I said that. As soon as possible, medically, but not too much. I talked about it, little bits. With those, my daughter was premature, 21 days in NICU. I was in there every day. I held her, I moved her, I connected with her. She, she, you know, she couldn't breastfeed yet, but, you know, I fed her. Immediately. By the way, in the NICU, they put the children inert. It is a really bad idea. Even if they were just on, on, on water, you know, water, little water mattresses, or if the nurses or the parents could come and be with them. And by the way, if you put the child naked against the naked body of the mother, the mother ups her temperature to match the temperature to fit the temp This research also shows it, did it in England. And just walk with the child gently and talk to the child very gently, like as if they're still in the womb. It, I, I, do you know how much movement the child gets in the womb? Non-stop. At night, too, the mother breathes. Movement is it. Movement is life. You deny movement. I mean, they can... We don't even know the trajectory of improvement if all those little Nikki's, Nikki's, babies got that right away, but there's research that shows that if they're touched and massaged, their brain goes 40% faster. Just the touch. So the touch with movement, oh my God, just do it. Be the first hospital that just does it and everybody else starts doing it. Go ahead. Say your name and talk. Hi, I'm Chantal Butler, formerly Chantal Forsyth. Um, June 2015, I went in for a, a routine brain surgery. I have a shunt and hydrocephalus. Um, came out completely left side paralyzed. Could not move that side. Could not talk. Could not walk. Could barely blink. Um, could not form words. Could not think straight. And mainly I've been doing this anapeneal. I found it. A nurse actually on 6300 introduced me uh, earlier 2016 and I got in December 2016. I've had three weeks of sessions since then. Um, I'm doing amazing. Um, yeah, this, this process, this therapy is amazing and yes I've done physio and that helped in the beginning but it got to the point where it set me back worse than what I than the injury I'd come out with and 
lot of pain. Um, and now I, just to name a couple things, I walk with no assistance, no cane, no walker, no wheelchair. And I, there's something else. I'm, I'm every day using my left side more. And it got to the point where it was like one day I was doing something and it was like, oh, I'm using my left side. Where I would just do this all day, every day. So it's amazing. Thank and you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. You're awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys for being here, for sitting through such a long presentation. And, uh, you know, if you sign your name, you'll be on our mailing list. This was announced in our mailing list, for example, this presentation. So we have people listening online as a result. And uh, if you have questions or if you start using some of the essentials, just take an essential a day or for three days. So do movement with attention and see how can I move my patients so they start paying attention to what they feel. And then do another few days slow and another one variation. And gradually, you, they'll, they work really well together. And, and let us know how it goes because just use it. It's free. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for everybody that helped. Thank you. We'll be here for a short while if you have any questions you want to come and talk to us. Hillary, Judy, you come up. You're awesome to be here.